So thank you very much and good afternoon everybody. I'm here to tell you um, about the European Medical Informatics Framework, which I suspect is one of the newest, if not the newest, IMI. Uh, we've been going now a little over three and a half weeks. So I'm going to tell you more about our objectives and our plans and some of the background than some of our outcomes. I'm not going to elaborate the point. I think Jill's made it very well. We have a problem, a substantial problem in the pipeline of drug development. And some years ago, a group of us were thinking, well, obviously this is a conversation that has gone all over the world in many contexts. What is the solution? And one of the components of the solution might well be um, biomarkers. <laughs> uh, tech guys, can we move it on, please? Uh, five people at the back. I wonder if one of them can move a slide. Yeah. Do you think we're over-provided in terms of... Uh... Oh, we've gone backwards. Anyway, the point is, do biomarkers help? Well, they may. And there was a group that... Uh, and again, please. Uh, a group that came together to look at the use of biomarkers, particularly in uh, measuring efficacy and in uh, measuring toxicity of compounds. There we go. So... Thank you. So on this... Oh, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Whoa. Let's hold it there just for a second. So this is an illustration of the problem that Jill was just talking about. Here you have real data, and on the y-axis is the mini mental state examination, which is a cognitive scale in dementia. There are many, but they all give you exactly the same kind of results. This is a four-year study that I'll tell you a little bit more about in the moment, a European study we're looking at controls, people with Alzheimer's disease, and people in a pre-Alzheimer's disease phase. Now, you look at that data, you look at the top box, and you think people, elderly people who are normal don't get any worse over a four-year period. That's good news. If you look at the bottom box, you can see people with a pre-MCI state, half of them don't get any worse over the next four years, but half of them do. But we can't tell the difference at baseline, so you need a biomarker for that. But I would suggest to you the real problem is that middle box. That middle box are real-world data over four years using a cognitive assessment in people with dementia. I would put it to you that you, if you didn't know anything about dementia, you wouldn't even know whether people got worse or not over a four-year period. And now you want to do a clinical trial, give half people drug and half people placebo, and you want to look for a signal in that noise. Good luck with that. We need biomarkers really desperately. So because of that, more or less simultaneously, there were a whole bunch of very large studies founded more or less simultaneously. And these have come together as a worldwide ADNI uh, grouping. So you know, if you're in the Alzheimer's disease field anyway, you know about ADNI, North American ADNI, a very large public-private flagship project of the FNIH. ADNURAMED is a European study of more or less the same size that was founded at about the same time, another public-private partnership. And historically, it's interesting because ADNURAMED was actually a pilot for the whole IMI process. So it was in FP6 before IMI had been invented. There's also similar ones in, a in Australia called ABEL, and there's now a Japanese and Chinese uh, ADNI. And these studies are working collaboratively together and with great results. So we've um, merged ADNURAMED data without, with ADNI data on a number of occasions. However, we want to do more than that. We want not just to do another one of these kind of similarly sized studies. We now want to accelerate our research at a literally unprecedented scale. And that's what the European Medical Informatics Framework sets out to do. And this truly is eye-watering in terms of a vision. When we look at the samples and subjects and cohorts that we're going to aggregate in this five-year project that we've just started... These are very, very large numbers. So these are not made-up numbers. These are the numbers that we actually have in our participants in, in EMIF. So we will have, at some point when we've completed the informatics, we will have access on information on more than 40 million Europeans. We're going to have Alzheimer disease data that is, at the get-go, 10 times larger than the ADNI study. We're going to have metabolics research data on over 20,000 subjects, including samples for biomarker analysis. 
and we're going to deal with the platform to enable us to aggregate this data in a secure means. So, I now want to revert and give you a little bit of background and tell you about a little study that we've done in my own centre. And I'm doing this in order to explain why we want to focus, in particular on EMIF, on moving towards bringing together data sets, including routine collected care data sets. I want to persuade you in a couple of slides that the time when we do yet another cohort study is beginning to come to an end and the future of medical research is in collecting data that we are getting through routine medical care. So I'm going to tell you about something that we've done at King's Health Partners, which is a large academic health sciences centre that provides total health care to that southeast quadrant of London, about 1.1 million people. So in the mental health component of that, we have digital electronic health records. So we have no paper any longer and haven't for about a decade. So about four years ago, we built onto our electronic health records system a system that allows researchers to utilise all that data in an anonymised format and now allows us to de-anonymise, go back to individuals and recruit them for clinical trials. So this is a data set of about 200,000 subjects with all of the data that doctors have collected in some of these people over very many years. So this is the technological solution. This is the IT, and I want you to pay no attention to this because it's not important. And I apologise to all my lovely IT friends. Um, and this is nothing to do with the IT struggles we're having this morning. But, you know, the, this afternoon, the, the problem to solve is not an IT problem. It's, the problem is not in the code. The problem is a person problem. And the real solution why we've enabled this system is in this slide. It's in the security model. Now, I'm not going to go through the detail of this, but we have a very rigorous security model that allows us to use all this data in a safe and secure means. And, you know, if there's one message I want to take you to take home today that is a real innovation, this security model is designed, led, and managed by patients. So this is not patients writing or helping us to write plain English in our consent sheets. This is patients are actually running the system. And it's, I think that it's because of that we've enabled, for the first time in the UK, uh, a use of electronic health records in this particular way. Now, the second problem is a bit closer to IT because the second problem is the real juice in the data, the really important information in the data, is written in text. Now, doctors, you can get doctors to fill in forms as much as you like, but you will always have some really recalcitrant, unhelpful, uncooperative doctor that insists on writing notes. I'm one of them, and I absolutely refuse to fill in a form that somebody else has designed. I write text the same as I was trained to do, and sometimes that ends up in a letter, which is PDF file, and that's the only data that exists on this patient. So we have to either change doctors' behaviour, or we have to use the data that they're producing. Which of those is best? Do you know, it's always best to do the easiest thing. And the easiest thing is to work out how to use the text data. So we built into our system a text mining process built on a system called Gate, which is an open source system. Let me give you just one example of this. I might write in my patient's notes, the mini mental state examination of this patient today was 15, but last week it was 20. Or I might write something even less helpful, like the mini mental today uh, was 15, but it was five points more than that a week and a half ago. So we have to then turn that text, sometimes quite complicated text, into um, numbers. And to cut a long story short, we've done that. This is a real example from a real patient. You might not be able to read the blue words, but that's the text that some doctor like me wrote. You can see some Zs in there. That's the anonymization process that happens. And the computer, through text mining, is able to very, very accurately work out what the MMSE score was on a particular date. And this is actually, it turns out to be more accurate than paying PhD students to trawl through the notes and do it themselves. 
We've now done this, not just for MMSE, but in the relation to dementia. We've done it for function, for service utilisation, and in relation to a question that came up in the panel discussion today that somebody was asked about the payers, we're now working with a bunch of uh, pharma to produce in the UK the data that NICE want, so uh, for reimbursement in effect, mm -hmm. to say how much does it cost, how much services do people with dementia use at different phases of their disease as they progress. In real world data, please, not in your modelling. Oh, and by the way, we also want it in, in the UK. That's the question NICE is asking the farmer. We can answer that with this data. So let me show you one specific piece of data. That graph looks relatively... Um, relatively unremarkable. Here you have people over four years before they're treated with, outside, uh, with donepazil. This is the point they're treated with donepazil. They get a little bit better and then they decline. That looks unremarkable because it looks like the clinical trials. Clinical trials that were pivotal that led to um, these drugs getting a license typically were a few hundred people typically in six months to one year, and typically, if not always, in a highly selected group of people. What's remarkable about this study is we see the same thing, but we see it over a four-year period now. We see it in normal, routine, collected care data, and we see it in more than 2,500 patient years of data. So in this graph, there is more than eightfold the amount of patient years of data than in the entire world's literature. This is from a single hospital. Can you imagine what we could do if we could do that, not just in one hospital, but in health services around Europe? Can you imagine what we'd do if we then combine that with our friends and colleagues' data in the US? So we're using this now, as I've said, uh, in pre-competitive collaboration. We're beginning to explore, can we find biomarkers of response? This, for me, was a, a seminal experience because this, for me, persuaded me of the value of routine collected care data. And in EMIF, we're now going to try and liberate this for 40 million Europeans. You can go beyond routine collected care data, and this is what we've now done over the past six months. That's what I've just told you about. What we've now built is a patient-owned health record that sits in the cloud. You can connect connected devices to that to enable all sorts of interesting things like monitoring sleep, for example, or weight in response to antipsychotic medications. Again, something that was raised this morning, we're introducing patient reported outcome measures as a routine uh, into, their, collected, in, into their, their own health record. You can connect to other systems. We're also collecting samples for biomarker studies. So I think that this is the future of healthcare. Something similar is being done in health providers all over the world. If we can liberate not just the notes that doctors collect, but if we can liberate the information that, that the real experts have about recovery and the real experts are the patients, then we could really advance our, our research. And that's what EMIF intends to do. So EMIF has three components. It has a horizontal platform, which is the IT platform, coloured orange here. And what the platform does is provide a mechanism that I'll show you in a minute to aggregate this data in a safe and secure environment. There are two vertical utilisation programmes. One of them is the discovery of biomarkers that are predictive of metabolic consequences of obesity. And the other is the discovery and validation of biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Europe's, the world's, two big chronic killers. We hope that this platform will become a platform for the future and there will be other vertical utilisation programmes introduced as time goes on. Very, very briefly, this is how we will find us, this is how we will move forward. This is where we are now. We have a lot of data that sits in silos in researchers' offices or in hospital systems. We have a lot of users or potential users, researchers, who would like to access that data. So the first thing we will do is catalogue the data. We will simply describe what is in the various data sets and the rules of engagement. We will then provide a space in the cloud for a personal, private, remote environment for research, that researchers will be able to aggregate data for specific purposes, analyse that data with tools that we will help them with, and then it will fade away and go back to the federated uh, owners of that data. 
So the objectives of the EMIF platform, the horizontal platform, are here. I won't read them out to you, but it's about accessing the data. It's about the governance of the data. It's providing tools to use the data. And very, very importantly, it's providing a business model for continuity of this platform. Broadly speaking, both the metabolic component and the Alzheimer's disease component progresses in this way. So we start with studies like Pharmacog, which is included in EMIF, which are small studies but with very large numbers of biomarkers. And as we progress through towards qualification, you need ever larger numbers of subjects and you need ever smaller numbers of analytes as you're getting closer and closer to precision of a biomarker. EMIF can provide that. So the Alzheimer's disease specific objectives are here. They're to collect the data that we require for biomarkers, to characterize those uh, study populations, to discover new biomarkers, and then to validate both existing and these new biomarkers. So we have one project, but there are three topics. There's the platform, the metabolic, and the Alzheimer's disease topics. I started off by saying we were thinking big. I think that EMIF will not just be thinking, but doing big. It is a very large consortia. It includes 58 partners, there are three separate consortia that are coming together. There are more than 200 individual PIs, 14 European countries. We have something in the region of 56 million euros. We are three projects in one. These are my colleagues. I co-coordinate the project with uh, my colleagues from Janssen, and we have leaders in the platform, the metabolic and the Alzheimer's disease. Very, very soon we will have a website, and I encourage you to go to that. I thank all of my colleagues for getting us to the point where we are. It has been an absolute joy to get to the point where we are. I'm colossally excited by this project, and I look forward to telling you more about its success as the years come.